keep my hands to myself No matter how hard I'm trying to The hand is an important tool in the body that often goes unnoticed. We use them for everything, from occupation to communication to sensation. And because we use our hands so often, we put them at an increased risk to injury and infection. The following is an approach to common hand infections and how to manage them. Hand infections are extremely common. They affect all age groups, with 40 being the median age. Most commonly they arise from lacerations, although only one in two people recall a specific injury. The subcutaneous tissue is the most affected, but tendon, joint and bone can all be involved. Staphylococcus aureus is the most common infectious agent. Before things get out of hand, it is important for us to recognize the following symptoms. Inflammatory changes such as erythema, swelling, pain or tenderness, limitations in movement and function, pus discharge, signs of prior injury, and there may be constitutional symptoms such as fever and lymphadenopathy. One also needs to obtain a detailed history of the insult. This includes its onset, which can be acute or chronic, the presence of any risk factors such as previous trauma, diabetes or immunosuppression, the occupation of the individual to determine causality and how the injury affects his or her life, and finally, hand dominance. Once one has determined that there is a likely infection of the hand, one needs to decide where it is exactly. Is it on the superficial or deep surface? Is it palmar or dorsal? Does it involve the fingers, nails or the pulp of the hand? This can be divided anatomically into either superficial or deep infections, superficial including paronychiae, felon, herpetic, whitlow, subcutaneous or web space abscess, and deep infections including infections of the synovial space or deep fascia, septic arthritis or necrotizing fasciae. One also needs to consider bites, which can be divided into either animal or human bites and can involve any area of the hand. The diagnosis of hand infections is made clinically, but in some instances you might consider investigations such as FBC and UNE, blood culture, pus swab, imaging such as x-ray and ultrasound, and tests to exclude other causes. The same management principles apply to all hand infections. Starting with general management, it is important to ensure that the airway, breathing and circulation of the individual as well as the neurovascular status of the hand are intact. One needs to remove any obvious cause of infection, like a foreign body, and elevate the hand and apply moist heat. Moving very swiftly onto medical management, one can administer analgesia, empiric antibiotics until microbiological sensitivity returns, as well as tetanus or rabies as necessary. Surgery is the mainstay of management, where one needs to debride any necrotic tissue, drain any pus, and irrigate with either no formal closure or delayed closure of the wound. One also needs to encourage early active movement or splint in the safe position if there is severe swelling and pain. So let's get our hands dirty with the types of hand infections, starting with superficial infections. Paronychia is an infection of the nail fold. It is due to minor events of trauma such as nail biting, manicure, finger sucking or dishwashing. It can either be acute lasting less than six weeks where it is usually bacterial or it can be chronic lasting more than six weeks where it is usually fungal. It presents clinically with redness of the skin, warmth of the infected nail, and there may be pus discharging from the nail fold. The infection usually starts under the nail fold, and if left will progress to subunguli or to the base of the nail, the eponychium. A felon is a painful abscess on the palmar aspect of the finger, which includes the middle and proximal pulp, mainly caused by splinters to the finger. The digital pulp is divided into multiple compartments by fibre receptor and can become infected, hence the felon. Symptoms include a prickly tightness of the fingers, progressing to severe throbbing and pain, which may affect sleep. Complications include posterior spread, which may result in osteomyelitis, flexotenosynovitis, and septic arthritis, or anterior spread, causing a collar stud abscess, which can burst, relieving the pain, but which is a danger sign as the overlying skin can become necrosed. Subcutaneous abscess is an infection anywhere in the subcutaneous tissue of the hand. Symptoms depend on where it presents. In the finger, one might have swelling, erythema, restricted motion at the joints, the digits may be in a flexed posture, and there might be possible pus discharge. In the palm, the infection is usually localised, as fibrous septae limit its spread. In the dorsum, the tissue is loosely anchored, allowing spread of the infection into two potential spaces, either the dorsal subcutaneous space, which is superficial to the extensor tendons, or the dorsal subapron neurotic space, which is deep to the extensor tendons. This usually presents with pain with extension. A web space abscess is an infection of the webs between the fingers. This usually starts as a palmar infection, which spreads dorsally. This can be as a result of a penetrating fissure, 
infection from a palmar callus, or spread from an adjacent abscess. The symptoms include pain and swelling of the web spaces, and a cardinal sign is splaying of the fingers. Let's delve deeper into deep hand infections. The flexor tendons of the hand are enclosed in a double layer synovial space. The synovial spaces intercommunicate, creating an optimal environment for bacterial growth. The bacteria proliferates within the sheath, causing increased pressure, obstructing the blood flow, and can cause tendon necrosis and rupture. The infection can spread between the bursts of the hand, most notably tracking from the radial to the ulnar bursa, forming what is called a horseshoe abscess. Isolated infection of the digital flexor sheaths is known as a flexure tenosynovitis. This presents with Cannaval's cardinal features, including fusiform swelling of the whole finger, partially flexed posture of the finger, tenderness across the flexor tendon sheath, and pain on passive extension of the finger. Deep fascial infection is a surgical emergency and may be due to penetrating injury, hematogenous spread, or spread from an adjacent tenosynovitis or abscess. There are three potential closed spaces of the palm, and these include the thena, the hypothena, and mid-palmar spaces. Mid-palmar symptoms include loss of palmar concavity, the long and ring finger may be in a partially flexed posture, or there may be pain on passive extension. The thena symptoms include an abducted thumb, fullness of the dorsum of the first web space, and pain on abduction and opposition of the thumb. Necrotizing fasciitis is a rapidly progressing, life-threatening soft tissue infection. It is characterized by widespread fascial necrosis with relative sparing of the underlying muscle. It is caused by a toxin-producing bacteria. When it initially presents, the symptoms may be worse than the clinical appearance. The patient may be septic, have fever, dehydration, and electrolyte imbalances. However, when one marks the erythema, it rapidly progresses and can cause necrosis of the underlying skin. This is a surgical emergency. Animal bites are most often caused by dogs, but bites from cats are infected more often as their sharp teeth inoculate bacteria into the wound. The most common organisms are Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, but also be wary of rabies. The management is to open the bite and irrigate the wound thoroughly, remembering to take a culture. If the patient presents early, the suture wound may be closed. If the presentation is late, the tissue may need to be debrided with thorough irrigation of the wound and delayed closure remembering a tetanus and rabies vaccination and antibiotics if indicated. Human bites can be direct when one is purposefully bitten or indirect, also known as a fight bite, when a clenched fist comes into contact with human teeth. A fight bite can damage the extensor tendon or cause a fracture of the metacarpal head, which can rapidly progress to septic arthritis. One needs a special type of x-ray of the hand called the brewer tun view to look for fracture of the metacarpal head, a retained foreign body or osteomyelitis. These patients are managed with hospital admission, broad spectrum antibiotics, irrigation and debridement of the wound, repair of any tendons and fractures, and delayed wound closure. While hand infections are common, it is important to acknowledge that there are other conditions that might present in a similar manner and which need to be excluded. These include gout, pseudogout, acute calcific tendinitis, a retained foreign body, a reaction to chemotherapeutic infusion, pyoderma gangrenosum, or a metastatic tumor. Now you know hand infections like the back of your hand. 